Am I really 20 minutes early? Stuff like so bad four times in Birmingham, Alabama. People tend to like nap in their hair. Thank you for coming. Thank you, I had to make a change so I can physically have sex. Eight months ago, I had a heat stroke during sex. Yes, I got sex during intercourse. That is a bittersweet experience right there. Because here's the deal, we all like sex, but when done properly, it's still a strenuous physical activity. And if you're out of shape, you got to prepare for that, all right? You can't just be having sex on a whim if you're out of shape. you got to spot that a couple days in advance, start stretching out, all right? And get all limbered up, you know? Maybe get the rotator cuffs working in case you want to give her the old punch, who knows, you know? Whatever you're into. Drink the fluids, hydrate. It's like if I just said, hey, dude, right now, stop what you're doing. Go outside and chop firewood for nine minutes. Most guys would be like, hell yeah, dude, I love chopping firewood. I'm a man. 
And you're going to get out there, you got your wood, you got your axe. If you're out of shape, you're going to start chopping that firewood. You're going to feel good at first. But about two minutes in, you're going to start to slow down. If you're sweating, you're out of breath, the wood's screaming at you to chop it harder. Chopping wood is not as much fun as I remember.
There's a meeting, OPI is doing another one of these meetings, which I will join when we're done eating.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Superintendent Elsie Arntzen, and you'll see that big sky blue background. These are the individuals that are going to be discussing today's agenda. So I'm, I'm very pleased that looks like we've got 15 participants at this point. Um, hopefully, this uh, will, uh, how do I want to say, use our time efficiently. We should be pretty much about an hour. And maybe on a beautiful night like tonight, it'll be even less. But the manner of this will be anytime you have any question, we can you can raise your hand. Um, it, I believe we've got everybody muted at this point, but we can unmute you. Um, and then this is a dialogue, a conversation. Uh, and of course, what we've got, um, we've got some overview of three pieces of legislation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jenna McKinney. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jenna McKinney, Director of Family Engagement for the State Superintendent. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that you're here spending your evening with us to go over some of these key pieces of legislation. Um, I'd like to introduce our legal counsel, Rob Stutz. Uh, he is our chief legal counsel here at OPI. He's going to be walking through these three pieces of legislation. It will be House Bill 234, Senate Bill 744, uh, that's about prayer in school, and then religious materials, House Bill 745. Rob? Thanks, Jenna. Good evening, everybody. Rob Stutz, chief legal counsel at the Montana Office of Public Instruction. Appreciate everybody being on. Um, what I'm going to be doing today is stepping through the, those pieces of legislation, and I'm not sure how familiar people are with the process for um, looking up legislation and um, going through it. So part of the presentation today is going to include just that overview of where to find the legislation so that you can see what, what the text is. Um, as mentioned, if you have questions, uh, catch our attention, raise your hand, and uh, we'll, tr we'll try to answer it. So um, with that is sort of the process that we intend to follow. Let me share my screen and let's look up, um, let's look up these bills. While Rob is doing that there with Zoom, it's automatically for chat as well. So I know Jenna will go through the chats when any question or addition might want to happen. And again, this is a discussion and a dialogue. So please feel free to interject to ask questions uh, and we'll do our very best to get that answer. So Mr. Stutz, are we ready? Yes, thank you, Superintendent. Um, so we've got a series of these uh, community discussions. We're on the July 26th um, community discussion, and you can see the three bills that we're going to be talking about, HB 234, HB 744, and HB 745. Um, and just by way of notice, we do have two more of these community discussion nights coming up, one on August 23rd one on September 20th. And so there's an opportunity to um, have another discussion about different legislation from the session. Uh, but today we're gonna focus on these three bills. For those of you unfamiliar with how to look up legislation, the legislature, um, you can access it through the website. And uh, can everybody see the legislative website that I have pulled up? No? So We've got a big blue screen on at this point. Well, let me let me let me uh, switch over to the legislative we website, and I apologize about that. Can you there. see the legislative website now? Thank you. Great. So um, the Montana Legislature, ledge.mt.gov, has a really quick and easy way to find the bills. You just go to Laws and Bills, 2023 Session Bill Lookup. And um, tonight we're talking about um, th three bills. We'll look up the first one, which is House Bill 234 regarding obscenity. So in that lookup screen, we just go House Bill 234. And it pulls up with this, um, with this table and other information about the bill. What we can see is that the bill 
um, starting at the bottom of the table, it was drafted, introduced, and finally um, approved by the legislature, signed by the governor back on May 10th. And to look at the exact text of the bill, it has current bill text, and we're, we're going to pull that up in PDF form so that we can look um, at the exact language of the bill to see what it says. Now, one thing I just want to be clear about is, although we're talking about legislation, and although I am the, the attorney here at OPI or one of the attorneys here at OPI, um, the information I'm providing is just general information about the legislation and about the bill. I can't provide specific legal advice, um, but if you do have questions about how the language of a bill applies to a situation you're facing, be sure to um, refer that question to your attorney for legal advice. But um, anyway, so now we've stepped through the process and we have the first bill that we're gonna be discussing tonight, House Bill 234 in front of us. This bill um, addresses three uh, sections in what we call Title, 30, uh, Title 45. So it addresses 45-8-201, Dash 205 and dash 206. And I should note, for those of you familiar with looking at school law statutes, the school code is located in Title 20, 20 of our code. These are located in Title 45, and that's because these bills address uh, criminal statutes. And so um, the this bill, which was introduced by Rep uh, Representative Phelan, um, although we're talking about it in a school context, uh, they actually are part of the criminal code in Title 45. And what we can see by looking in Section 1 of the bill is that this amends an existing statute. And so you'll be able to see the amendments as either underlines if it's added new text or strike throughs if um, it's eliminated existing text, that is text that was in the uh, previous version, or the then current version of the statute. And text that remains unchanged has neither underlines nor strike throughs. And so one important takeaway when looking at this bill is that by and large, nothing was changed. Um, we had an obscenity statute in Montana and there are no changes to most of the bill. And when reviewing, the um, the legislation, what we're interested in is what did change. And in this uh, section one of the bill, uh, there's a reference added to school districts and to policies. And what this says is uh, that school districts may adopt policies that are more restrictive as to obscenity than this this statute, this section already provides. And so the bill doesn't change what is obscene. The bill doesn't change anything about the penalty, which is a misdemeanor conviction with a fine of between $500 and $1,000 and a potential jail term that doesn't exceed six months or both of those remedies, those punishments. Um, and so nothing was changed about the substance of obscenity, the crime of obscenity in Montana, except to say to give school districts flexibility to adopt more rigorous policies. The second. Um, so Rob, Rob yeah. let's stop right there. And if you could enlarge it, because of course. It, I've got glasses on, but oh, thank you. I think that would be very, very helpful. So if okay. we look at the very first section of where school districts were added to it and policies were there. Let's see if there's any questions that from any of our participants at this point. Jenna, do we have any out there with hands raised? Or if anyone would like to ask Rob any questions of what this means prior to those amendments or what they might mean currently? No questions so far. Is there a is there a brief description of of uh, school districts uh, having issues in pa in prior years where they needed this kind of power 
is are there any specific examples where where obscenities were uh, running rampant in school districts and they couldn't do this because they didn't have this change? Yeah, so uh, I, I understand the question. I'm not sure what the motivating reason was. Um, of course, the legislators had those uh, committee hearings and the public comment at the time. I do know that school districts have policies and a number of those policies um, could impact uh, or could be impacted by various considerations that uh, regard you know what's appropriate in school or not, whether it's a, a computer use policy or a policy regarding um, you know appropriate instruction. So those policies vary from school district to school district. And um, because of our local accountability in our Montana uh, Constitution, so um, this, this change, I think, simply recognizes that flexibility at the local level. It doesn't, uh, you know, as far as the impetus for it, I'm I'm not aware of what that was. But um, as far as the school districts having th that control over their policies, that's a longstanding recognition in Montana law. And this amendment um, just added that flexibility, that local flexibility, into the language of the of the code. It doesn't, it's no more restrictive regarding obscenity. Um, there's a, you know, the, the definition says that school districts are permitted to have more restrictive policies, but the statute itself and the legislation are no more restrictive than they've ever been. Okay, thank you. I see a hand up um, with one of the participants. Yes, David, to answer your question, uh, to the best of my ability, because I attended the hearings for this bill, uh, there were no school districts that suggested that they were having this kind of problem. I did not hear any school districts come up and describe a problem and the fact that they needed this addition in order to address that problem. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, maybe somewhere down down screen will become clear why we needed this bill. Well, I do have a question. Um, are you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So um, there's some books being introduced into the English curriculum in high school where my kids go. One is called The Kite Runner. And there's a very explicit rape scene in there. There's an, I don't know if it's that book or one of the other five books that us, many of us parents are against. It has the F word like 89 times. Um, and we went to the school board meeting and very much disapproved. Many parents got up and spoke in disapproval. And so I'm just wondering where we stand. Is the school still allowed? Ultimately, the school board voted three to two, voted it in to adopt these books and well, we as parents don't like it if i can interject because i was in um i was also in those hearings and it, if you have questions in that nature on the arguments for or against i would encourage you to um you you one can reach out to the legislator who crafted the bill um, but also you could go back and listen to those hearings because you got to hear both sides of the argument there was there were parents um, that did speak to that um, so that we can stay on uh, track of going through the legislation. Um, I would really encourage you to go back and um, listen to that hearing because it it covered uh, um, a broad swath of opinions on if this is needed or not needed and all the arguments on both sides. Um, and just to make sure you all know, if you do have questions, feel free to use the chat box as well. Um, I'm glad to stop Rob, as we go through the bill um, and get him to address your questions, but raising your hand works as well. So appreciate the good questions. If yeah. I, if I could Rob, also well, interject real quickly, noticing on that line five of that first section, the words were permissive with that may. So what I, I do appreciate from being a legislator in my previous job, um, that this is not a demand. This is a mindful that you could 
that it's a possibility. And as Rob, as you had said, this is the flexibility that I believe this bill offers. It is not a mandate that they have to adopt um, things that might even be more restrictive or not. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Um, you know, different uh, different communities, different school boards might have uh, different policies. We see policies vary across the state on a variety of grounds, and so this uh, recognizes that a school district could, but it doesn't require that they do adopt more restrictive policies. All right, I don't see any more hands. So moving on to section two of the bill. Um, this is not a section that establishes any uh, criminal penalty. This is just a definition section. And it defines uh, one of the additions was a definition of the term commercial establish establishment. And I'll just su suffice to say that whatever a commercial establishment is, it does not include a school. And so that's the that's the takeaway from this component of the legislation is that a school, a commercial establishment is not a school. And that's important um, as we move down the legislation, you can see that previously, previously there had been a definition of a newsstand and that definition was clarified to say that a new, uh, yeah. newsstand does not include a school. And so that's the important part in section two of the bill is it made clear that the definitions of newsstand and the definition of commercial establishment don't include schools. And where that comes in, um, it, well, I guess I'll just stop since that's the end of section two. Does anybody have any questions about um, section two? Those are the only two changes in that section was the inclusion of the commercial establishment definition and the exclusion in both commercial establish establishment and newsstand of schools. From those definitions. Okay, well, moving on, uh, section three of the bill is again, now this is a criminal penalty, and just like the other one, you can see that there's very little that's changed in this uh, in this in this part of the code. Um, but we can see the use of the word commercial establishment or newsstand. A person having custody control or supervision of a commercial establishment or newsstand may not knowingly or purposely. And so uh, we know from the amendments to the definition that a commercial establishment or newsstand does not include a uh, school. And so schools are excluded from the application of this first paragraph of the bill. And um, that adds some clarity that previously in the previous uh, version of the bill or of the statute, uh, schools also were excluded from application of the statute. The structure was a little bit different, but nonetheless, it previously said a person does not violate this section if they're employed by a school and they're serving an educational purpose of a school and they've got a policy, um, you know, the, the use of the material is in accordance with the policy. And so the net result of um, these series of changes is that in all likelihood, um, something that wasn't criminal before is still not criminal as long as it's in the context of that educational program at a school. Um, one thing that uh, did change is that this, this statute, which has to do with the public display and dissemination of obscene material, did explicitly include what the penalty was. Um, previously, you had to look to a different statute to see what the penalty for violation was. Um, and um, let's see, that's... I, I apologize. This statute it didn't include it didn't include the penalty in there. There's still the other section that includes the penalty, but nonetheless, the penalty is similar. It's up to six months and it's a five hundred dollar fine. But what they did include is that previously didn't exist is this language similar to the obscenity statute, 
that says that cities, towns, counties, school district may adopt policies that are more restrictive um, than the requirements of the statute. So there is some, there are some uh, more changes to uh, to this statute um, in this legislation. But at the end of the day, the most significant uh, the most significant change is that local flexibility that um, school districts have to adopt policies more restrictive depending on the local school board or the local school community's uh, you know needs. Are there any questions regarding this section of the bill? So Rob, in a nutshell, you know, knowing um, that House Bill 234 went into law, what exactly is the implication then for our public school system? So the, the biggest implication is that under the legislation, public schools have more have a recognition that they can adopt policies more restrictive of obscenity or the display and dissemination of obscene material than um, the statewide requirements. So it does allow that flexibility at the local level. Thank you. Any questions regarding or any uh, questions on application of this law that we might need to uh, get clarified before we move on to the other two pieces? Yeah, so schools are required to adhere to what's written here. They cannot provide obscene material and on and on. Is that right? I'm trying to understand if schools are required to uh, function by what is written. Sure. So the, the two criminal provisions that are addressed in this bill, obscenity, is in 458201 and the public display or dissemination of obscene materials to minor the application to schools remains largely unchanged since their previous version so th this legislation um, added that flexibility at the policy level but this uh, legislation didn't make um, any significant change to the application of the statutes to schools. It did it in a different way. It did it by excluding schools from the definition of commercial establishment or newsstand, whereas before it had language that um, you know, excluded the bona fide use of um, certain materials, obscene materials, um, as long as it was consistent with the policies. But nonetheless, the criminal penalty applies um, in almost exactly the same way as it did before. So I guess, again, the takeaway is for the takeaway for schools is that there was more flexibility given to local school trustees um, as far as uh, how they can define their local policies. Hmm. So if I could add, if there are any questions at all, it is so important to go to the school visit with um, the trustees, the, start with the teachers, start with whomever within that school and get better information or information that um, you can understand moving forward then quite possibly go to a school board meeting. This is that local accountability. Uh, but in my mind, I think Rob had it in a nutshell, anything that is determined obscene or with the dissemination of obscene materials hasn't changed. It's still exactly how it was prior to this law. What it did add is that it recognized schools to be able to have a permissive policy that might be more restrictive. And I believe that, Rob, am I correct in that determination? Yeah, that was the most substantive change is um, is giving the that uh, authority to the um, the local school boards. Exactly. I know a lot of I know you know we get contacts from a lot of people curious in being involved in the local uh, school boards, and um, you know this is 
a, a tool that the legislature has recognized is available to those school boards. So if I understand like the last 50 years of Supreme Court decisions, the, the, the United States Supreme Court has been actively trying to dissuade folks from calling things obscene unless there is an extreme case to be made for it. Are, are, has Montana attempted here to allow local school districts to kind of push the envelope on what's called obscene in hopes that maybe it'll make its way to the Supreme Court and suddenly the definition of obscenity will get lowered? Is, is that your sense of what we're after here? You know, I don't know if I don't I don't know what the intent was, you know, by the uh, legislators. It's it's my understanding or it's my belief, I guess, based on what they adopted, that they were looking for a, 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 an approach that allowed that local flexibility. But as far as um, having a, a larger um, agenda to try to influence the United States Supreme Court case law. Um, I, I don't have any sense of that. Might it go there? Perhaps, but you know, they didn't change the definition of obscenity. They didn't change the definition of the dissemination or display of obscene materials. So as far as the definitions at the statewide level, um, you know, there was no, there was no a, a attempt to, to make that change. The other thing that I'll note is that the addition of the school districts to um, starting off with um, you know the, the first section, the 458201, there was already was in Montana code, these political subdivisions, cities, counties, or towns, already had under Montana state law the authority to adopt ordinances or regulations that were more restrictive. And so, you know, effectively what this legislation did is it added one more political subdivision, school districts, and then it added the mechanism that school districts use to adopt their, you know, required behavior, which is policies. So it's not, it's not even, um, it's not even, you know, for the first time allowing local political subdivisions to have more restrictive, restrictive approaches. The statute already did that at the city, town, and county level. It simply added school districts to that list. So, um, as far as as far as the motiv motivation, I can't speak to that. But as far as the effect, um, you know, it provided a level opportunity for the local school districts that the cities, town, towns, and counties already had under the statute. Rob, there's a Sharon. Uh, Patton Griffin has a question. She has her hand raised. Great. Sharon, we can't hear you. You'll have to unmute. Thank you. So what I, the way I understand, what I heard you say, interesting how ears are different, uh, is that school districts and libraries were excluded from being punished or liable uh, criminally from doing any of these things that are listed here uh, in section one. Is that correct? No, no, that's not quite correct. So section one, the crime of obscenity refers to persons. And so section one doesn't speak to the application to school districts, it, it speaks to individuals. Um, what, what I was referring to is the definitions in section two that excluded schools, libraries, et cetera. That's the definition of commercial establishment and the definition of newsstand. Those terms are used down in section three which is a different crime, the public display or dissemination of obscene materials to minors. And so those definitions that we reviewed have no application to the crime of obscenity, which is in section one. They only have an application to um, this crime, which is in section three of the bill. And you can see the use of those terms right here. And so- uh -huh. 
so those those definitions don't affect the application of the crime of obscenity. Okay, but this then section three public display or dissemination of obscene material to minors does not apply to schools or libraries. Well, yeah, specifically it says a person having custody control or supervision of a, not a school, not a school, may, be knowingly or pur may not knowingly or purposely do this. And, and so this, this exclusion, we'll say, of this uh, statute to schools existed in a different form, but what was previously section 2B right here, where there was an exclusion for schools, you know, consistent with the education purpose and school policies. So um, the, the statute previously spoke to schools and previously spoke to libraries or museums and um, had a, an exclusion for them anyway. So the, the, the substantive change, the biggest change, frankly, is um, not whether it applies to schools, libraries, or museums, but whether those schools, libraries, or museums have the, uh, or not the schools, libraries, whether the schools, cities, counties, towns have the flexibility to adopt more restrictive policies. So I, I hear what you're, you're pointing out. I don't think that that's a significant change in the statute, um, but it's a different way of addressing um, whether or not it applies to a school. And in this case, they excluded it from schools by virtue of the definitions of these words rather than by virtue of a, uh, an exclusion that they, they previously had down here. Okay, so schools are basically excluded unless their local boards choose to make changes that are more... Uh, Yes, yeah, schools okay. schools are not now and have not been, generally speaking, included in this particular um, statute. And the local board um, application would be via a policy, not via the criminal statute. It just says that this criminal statute doesn't limit the ability of schools and other political subdivisions to adopt more restrictive policies. But I should point out that that's not true, the exclusion of schools. That's not true, and it hasn't been true under the obscenity statute 458201. Effectively, there was no significant change between, as a result of this legislation, um, to the application of schools, except for the recognition of the ability to adopt policies. If I can interject for just a moment, Rob, uh, I would encourage you to go listen to the testimony in committee. Uh, there was, I remember, I'm not sure if it was on the Senator House side, but there was um, testimony as to the history of why, why the changes in this bill. Um, I'm, you know, I don't speak to the accuracy of the testimony, but it was interesting perspective, and I, I think you would get. Uh, at least some of your speculative questions answered from, um, you know, what, what you all are considering um, the history of this. Um, I think it might speak to some of those questions you have. So Rob, in the chat, there are a couple questions regarding the First Amendment. And I don't know with what Jenna is saying, if there was any legal opinion done on this that might chill that effect of the First Amendment. So um, yeah, we can hop over and, and, and look at that. So this is that page we looked at earlier with the history of the bill. And um, I'll, I'll note that um, normally there would be a legal note if the bill resulted in a, a legal concern of consequence to the legislative staff that they wanted to inform the legislative legislators of. The other thing I'll, I'll point out is that a number of amendments to the bill were considered um, and some of them were adopted. And so the language, the final language of the bill doesn't reflect 
the language of the bill as, as initially introduced. I'm not here really to talk about the legislative process um, because it, it did undergo some some amendments. Um, you know, I'm acknowledging the legislative process, but mostly I'm interested in what the result was. And the result mm -hmm. is, is is this final language. And so if you are interested, you can go and look through how the bill language um, was proposed to be amended and changed over time through various amendments. Um, um, but there, I'll just note there was no there was no legal note attached to this bill by the legislative staff. I guess the other thing, superintendent and everybody having questions, but I'll note is um, regarding the First Amendment. Of course, I I can't give a legal opinion about that um, in this chat or in this conversation, but also the substance of what is obscene wasn't even affected by this bill. And so it would be a similar legal analysis before, you know, for the statute before and after the legislation, the, the scope of obscenity didn't change. Thank you. Jenna, do we have anyone else with hands raised? Okay, thank you. Rob, let's go to the next one then. All right, so we've got two more bills to cover. Um, we're gonna use the same process that we used. We're gonna to go to the legislative website, go to legislative bill lookup and House Bill 744, just pull it up. And um, we've got a similar page, except now it's regarding House Bill 744. And I'm also going to do that for House Bill 745, because those two bills are really related to each other. They're both bills introduced by Representative Kometz. Um, you can see 745 Kometz there, 744 Kometz there. Um, some differences from the previous bill, besides the, the subject matter, is that neither of these have any amendments. And so these bills were passed um, with the same language that they were introduced. I'll also note that neither of these bills have, um, have legal notes. And so again, you can track the history of the bills, but the takeaway from my perspective is that they passed and um, were signed by the governor and got a chapter number. So both of these are currently the law of Montana. Um, we're going to open up the text of the bills. And so 744, 745, um, these are not long bills. You can see that they substantively end at the bottom of page one. And for the second bill, it also ends at the bottom of page one. And so they're, they're really quite short. Uh, another interesting thing about them is that they are two bills from the same legislator and they both amend the same statute. That is 20-7-112. And so um, the legislative staff are going to have to go through and figure out how to reconcile the language in these bills because um, 744 adds a subsection two with an additional provision under the part that reads this section does not prohibit. 745 changes this the this section does not prohibit language and adds it as a subsection B. And so section two is something else. So anyway, there's an editing process that the legislative staff will have to go through to reconcile these two bills, but it's probably easiest just to step through them in order and talk about what the changes are. Um, Can you increase the size for us, please, Rob? Yeah, and I apologize. They open oh, up with that default size. You're and good. So let me Thank just you. make them bigger. Thank you. Is that easier to read? All right. So, um, so House Bill 744, um, substantively, all it did is it took an existing um, reference to these are not prohibited and then add something else that's not prohibited. It doesn't prohibit a student from initiating or participating in a conversation about religion, religious beliefs, or religious practices 
with another student or a teacher. Um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what else there is to say about that, Bill. Uh, I, I guess I would say that a number of, um, I, there's already a recognition by the Supreme Court that individuals can talk about their faith or if they don't have a faith, the lack of a faith or what, whatever about religious topics in school. And so um, this, this bill codifies that right to free speech about one's religious beliefs um, in, in, uh, in this statute. Any questions for Rob? Uh, Jenna, do we have any hands raised or anybody would like to offer anything? Well, I'll start out with the same question I asked last time. Were, were there specific instances where students had been prosecuted or expelled from their schools because they had done this and therefore we needed this legislation to protect them? Or, or were there other kinds of concerns that caused the legislators to introduce these two bills? Well, um, so let me, I guess, point out a difference between this bill and the previous bill we looked at. This bill is housed in Title 20. Um, Title 45, the one that we looked at was a criminal code and it provided for criminal penalties. This is not a criminal code at all. This is a, a statute within the school code. So that's in within Title 20. In the school code, already had uh, this existing statute that addressed some of the questions about uh, religion in school. And so um, adding, so I, I, again, I can't speak to what the motivating factors were, but um, adding this ability to engage in free speech, um, I, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't add um, anything beyond what the United States has already um, recognized. So perhaps it's a clarifying um, language in Montana's prayer and school statute to recognize what um, what was already possible. Um, you can, of course, speak with the legislators about that or listen to the legislative hearings. I don't know of any uh, particularly motivating event for that, but um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't seem to add anything beyond what the courts have already recognized. That is the um, right to engage in speech about one's faith. David, I appreciate your question. I'm going to put um, Representative Kmet's contact information. It's also available to the public on the legislative website, but I will put that in the chat box. Um, because it'd be good to follow up with the legislate, legislator who um, carried this bill to ask that question directly of him. That's just not something we have the answer to. So he would be a good I resource for you. No, I appreciate that. And it looks like section one still makes it very clear that, that uh, religious materials cannot be distributed by schools. So it's, it's illegal or by statute to uh, distribute Bibles or distribute religious texts. But if a student were to ask that would be permitted. Yeah, that so, makes it pretty clear. So Thank yeah, section, section one of the statute, yeah, was was unaffected. Uh, whether section one is uh, constitutional, if challenged under the United States Constitution or the Montana, I I don't know. But you're right. Section one of the bill was not impacted at all by this legislation. The, the other thing I'll note, um, Jen, I appreciate you you know, talking about the availability of legislators. Um, uh, on the, the website that we were looking at, there is um, information about um, the different legislators and most, I think all legislators um, list under their profile, some way for constituents and other citizens of Montana to get a hold of them. So, um, you know, post it in the chat or you can go to the same legislative website to um, understand how to get a hold of those legislators with those questions about, you know, motivating events. Are there any other questions about House Bill 744? I think Sharon has her hand up. 
Hey, Sharon, you're still muted. I do, but I think that uh, I'll just wait because the same language, the school prayer language is extremely concerning to me. And I am not sure. I can't, I mean, as a 43 year old, three year long teacher and administrator, I would not ever have considered, and I would have considered that I broke the law opening school with a prayer. And certainly personally, I could pray and many days I did, but uh, this, you know, opening my school over the loudspeaker with a prayer, uh, I think that's pretty iffy. And so, Sharon, I think you're referring to this this language right here. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, that that language um, has existed in Montana code for a long time. It wasn't affected by this legislation. We'll see that it was affected by the next piece of legislation, and you know we we can talk about that. But the recognition that uh, a, a school day may be opened. With uh, with a prayer is is not new to Montana. Whether it would pass review if uh, challenged um, is a is sort of a separate question. But as far as I know, this section of Montana code um, has never uh, been subject to a constitutional challenge. In my school law courses through my doctorate, it has been made very clear that. There is a separation between school as government and religion, and the opening school with a prayer would result in challenges of a very unpleasant sort. But yes, let's go on to the next one. Thank you, sir. Sure. Right. And I guess the one thing I would say is, you know, this statute doesn't speak to the manner of prayer, right? That's very right. A very, yes. a very broad construction would would be that you know the the school day over the loudspeaker opens with prayer. A very narrow construction would be that teachers, principals, or superintendents can start the day in uh, private prayer to themselves. It, it it really doesn't have a lot of information about um, what that means, but that's okay. Um, just foreshadowing a little bit, that language gets changed in the next bill. So let's. Let's hop over to 745 and um, see what that says. So 745, um, again, it's the same statute um, that's being amended. It's just being amended in a different way. And, uh, you know, visually there's a restructuring of the statute, but, um, and then there's a description here in the catchphrase of the statute that just notes that um, religious materials are allowed. I'll just point out that these uh, catchphrases uh, don't um, don't have uh, any significant legal meaning. They're just an attempt by the legislature to provide a convenient shorthand for the subject matters addressed by the statute. But in any event, you can see the first thing that they did here was remove that sentence that Sharon pointed out. Um, the rest of this, this component of it stays basically the same, except now there's a re reference to subsection one, and that's because the statute was restructured to include both a subsection one and a subsection two. But really the significant changes are down here um, where some uh, additional uh, exclusions, an additional exclusion was added. This subsection does not prohibit a pupil from reading the Bible or other religious material during free time. And um, I think that's um, widely recognized, um, not particularly groundbreaking uh, piece of legislation because um, an individual's private exercise of their own faith, uh, even in a school setting, is, uh, is has been recognized for a long time. Um, the next one says, the school class, the school class, of course, has 
requirements for self self selected reading. A pupil must be allowed to read from the Bible or other religious material to meet those requirements. Um, again, um, this is referring to uh, an individual who um, has the discretion to choose the reading material for a class. And uh, this would be uh, preventing, if students weren't allowed to self-select uh, religious materials, then um, arguably that would be the school um, limiting one's free, exp free expression of religion. And so this just, uh, I think, is an acknowledgement that schools can't discriminate against an individual based on their religion, including if they're allowed to self-select their reading materials for a class. And then the final section is the new section two, prayers permitted in a school on school grounds and at school sponsored events, but a person may not be compelled to pray. The school day may begin with a prayer. And you know the ending of that is an uh, obvious allusion to the previous language where it said the school day uh, may open with a prayer. And so this appears to be a continuation of a principle that we have in Montana law that, again, as far as I know, has never been challenged, but is longstanding. And then um, this portion of it appears to be a recognition, like we saw in House Bill 744, that uh, um, you know, there are, there's an appropriate time and an appropriate place, even in schools, for conversations about religion. Um, so that extends to the act of praying in a school, on school grounds, and at school sponsored events. Um, but again, it, it requires the individual to pray or not pray as they see fit, uh, again, prohibiting the compulsion. Of, of prayer by an individual. Um, this idea is, uh, so the US Supreme Court has had some uh, more recent cases, and in particular, there was a case called the Kennedy case that uh, addressed, uh, in, that, in that situation, it was a staff member, a football coach, who was um, praying on the football field after games, in uh, in Washington State, and um, the school district uh, ultimately didn't renew the football player, the football coach's contract for the subsequent year. That case about whether the coach was allowed to pray, um, but not compel other people to pray, whether he was allowed to pray, went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, issued its decision in the Kennedy case, and that recognized that the school district can't prevent an individual, in, including a coach, from um, from private prayer um, on school property. And so, although the language of this amendment um, it doesn't specifically address that context, it is uh, more broadly recognizing the right of individuals um, to engage in private prayer, even on school property. I think in the case of the Kennedy decision, I think wasn't the wasn't the private location the the middle of the fifty <laughs> yard line of a of a, of a stadium? Yeah, in, in the in the in the Kennedy case, the the location of the coach's prayer was the 50 yard line of the field after the game was over and the US Supreme Court said that that was okay. Okay, but not exactly a private location. No, it wasn't a private location but it was it was private prayer. Right? It wasn't Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, right, I mean anywhere that you could you know, I said many prayers before tests when I was in school and it wasn't exactly a private location, but the prayer was my own. Sharon, did you have a question? I saw your hand go up. 
Well, yeah, I just have to be careful here because this is so frustrating to me. But not only was it in the middle of the field with the stands still full, but the players knelt down and prayed also. Now, there was an argument in this case in the Supreme Court that that particular situation forced religion on the players, on the children, because the coat, the power to play or not, not play any of those players. And if a player chose not to kneel down, there could be a, a reasonable fear that that player could be punished by the coach not being able to play. So while our very conservative Trump-appointed Supreme Court allowed this to pass, it broke precedent. And it is in complete contradiction with the establishment clause of our, of our First Amendment. I'll, and I'll quit now. Yeah, so the idea that an individual is allowed to pray privately at school is, um, is has, has been long rec uh, recognized by the Supreme Court. And um, prior to um, some recent U.S. Supreme Court cases, the uh, most people um, looking at Supreme Court jurisprudence um, would be familiar with what's, what was called the lemon test. And the lemon test was a test that was applied to uh, uh, analysis of whether religious activities in schools were permissible or not. Um, you, you'll want to talk with your own attorney about the um, application um, of the lemon test. It, uh, some commentators uh, believe that the lemon test is no longer valid law. Other commentators believe that the lemon test, which is the test a lot of uh, individuals might learn in a school law class, for example, that the lemon test has been modified, but still has some application. But in, in any event, um, this language, again, although not specifically addressing the Kennedy decision, seems to be consistent with the, um, the perspective that the US Supreme Court upheld in that decision. So we're close to the end here. There's one more question in the chat box. Um, from Carol Mackin, uh, and she asks, the Attorney General ruled um, on 623 that the bill titled HB 234 was not legally sufficient for voters to understand. Does this mean that the legislators did not know what they were voting for? I'm sorry, which bill are they talking about? HB 234. Um, HB, oh, that was the earlier one. Yeah, the obscenity yeah. bill. Yeah, so um, you know, as far as the some um, disagreement about the the title of a bill and the legal sufficiency that uh, may be in a legal opinion, um, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't really speaking to the a, a dispute about the title of a bill, um, but I was more looking at the substance of what HB two thirty four said. Um, and so I'm I'm just unfamiliar with um, and not prepared to speak about an AG uh, or some attorney's opinion about whether a bill title was legally sufficient. But you no, know, when we were discussing HB 234, we were going over the substance of the change to, to the law, not the not the bill title. With that, we're getting close to the end here. Are there any more questions that anyone has on any three of these bills? Superintendent, would you like to close out? Of course, thank you. I appreciate everyone's attention today. Thank you. And Rob, thank you and OPI staff for putting this together. Everyone, I'm glad that you're here. You know, new changes to school legislation does affect our schools. So our job at the agency is to be as transparent as possible to see what does that change mean to our school administrators, to our school teachers, 
to our students and to our parents and all of our communities across our state. So we'll be having another one. Rob, do you want to put that back on the screen of when the next one will be and what the next uh, discussion of the legislation will be? Yep, coming up in just a second. Thank you. Perfect, and a little bit larger. <laughs> So this was our second discussion that we had. The first one was about the charter school bills. Uh, this one, of course, was about the obscenity bill, notification requirements, and religious freedom. And the next one is going to be on the Special Needs um, Equal Opportunity Act that was put forward by Representative Benton. So we'll be doing that one um, pretty soon, though, because our school doors will be crossed our state. Some will be opening on that Wednesday, August 23rd. And then we'll be discussing two parental rights bills in September. Please reach to us if you have any questions at all. We are fully transparent and fully available in this educational moment. So with that, blessings to all of you. Thank you so much and take care. Bye-bye.